Review. Understanding Oxygen Toxicity by Peter de Noble. Oxygen toxicity has been known since the 19th century, but we are still learning about its causes and mechanisms. In diving practices of past years, pure oxygen and gas mixtures with oxygen content different than that of air were used exclusively by military or commercial divers. In the last several decades, enriched air nitrox or EAN has become part of mainstream recreational diving, whereas technical diving, which maximizes the use of oxygen to minimize decompression risks, is becoming increasingly popular. The accumulated experience in recreational diving and technical diving now exceeds the previous experience in military and commercial diving. Both scientific research and diving practices advance our knowledge of oxygen toxicity and from time to time we should take a step back to make sure we all share the benefits of this knowledge. Oxygen convulsions were first described by Paul Baer in 1874. He noted convulsions in larks in air compression to 20 atmospheres absolute. He then compressed the larks in pure oxygen and they convulsed at pressures as low as 5 atmospheres. Baer concluded that the convulsions represented a sign of oxygen toxicity upon the central nervous system or CNS and this was later shown to be correct. In 1899 Lorraine Smith described pulmonary oxygen toxicity in rats. Problems started when rats breathed 45% oxygen at normal pressures. When breathing 73% oxygen, rats developed fatal pneumonia within four days. At higher pressures, the symptoms developed even sooner. Since that time, we have learned more about the manifestations and some of the underlying mechanisms of oxygen toxicity. All manifestations of oxygen toxicity are dose-dependent. Symptoms of CNS oxygen toxicity, which includes seizures, may occur after short exposures to partial pressure of oxygen greater than 1.3 atmospheres in exercising divers. This equates to breathing pure oxygen at 3 meters of seawater. Resting divers, in comfortable conditions, can tolerate 1.6 atmospheres of oxygen well. Pulmonary manifestations occur after several days of breathing partial pressures greater than 0.45 atmospheres. In addition, repetitive and prolonged use of hyperbaric gases, such as 30 hours or 10 days of oxygen partial pressures greater than 1.3, have revealed ocular manifestations, in other words, high oxygen-induced nearsightedness. Cold, exercise, certain drugs and increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide increase susceptibility to oxygen toxicity. So who's exposed to the risks of oxygen toxicity? Divers using EAM, as well as open circuit and rebreather divers using mixed gases are potentially exposed. CNS O2 toxicity can occur if nitrox divers exceed depth limits or mistakenly breathe the wrong gas. Cold, strenuous exercise and certain medications can also increase the risk, as well as unknown individual and environmental factors. Divers using mixed gases in open circuit scuba diving incur the risk of confusing various gas mixtures that they carry or using too much oxygen during decompression. Closed circuit rebreather divers run the risk of incorrectly selecting the partial pressure of oxygen, as well as several mechanical errors. These may include errors in gas mixing, displaying erroneous oxygen values, or excess carbon dioxide in the breathing loop because of an equipment malfunction. CNS toxicity is the main form seen in diving. Pulmonary oxygen toxicity is typically not a concern except in very long technical dives, such as extended cave or technical rebreather dives, which last hours. Prolonged dives within the safe limits for CNS oxygen toxicity may still cause ocular or eye toxicity, 
which manifests by the narrowing of visual fields and nearsightedness. Divers suffering decompression illness may also potentially be at the risk of oxygen toxicity when they are treated. Pure oxygen at sea level pressure, or normobaric oxygen, is often provided as first aid during evacuation and it's well tolerated up to 24 hours. However, because divers will most likely also receive hyperbaric oxygen or recompression, air brakes may be considered in extreme circumstances, such as when access to hyperbaric treatment is delayed. Generally, these brakes will occur naturally as the injured diver eats, drinks or needs to use the bathroom. Note that these brakes are intended to forestall the symptoms of pulmonary oxygen toxicity when oxygen is breathed under normal baric conditions. There is no risk of seizures or other CNS manifestations due to normal baric oxygen breathing. Air brakes should also not be used if transport to a hyperbaric chamber is going to involve only a few hours. During the hyperbaric chamber treatment, Divers may be exposed to much higher oxygen pressures than would be safe to use while diving. The oxygen pressure used during treatment represents a balance between risk and benefit. Oxygen is generally better tolerated under the resting conditions of a hyperbaric chamber rather than the rough conditions experienced in water. Also, there is no risk of drowning in a hyperbaric chamber. Oxidative and nitrosative stress at the root of oxygen toxicity are so-called reactive oxygen species, or ROS. These short-lasting forms of oxygen molecules occur as the byproducts of normal metabolic processes and play an important role in the body's normal functioning. With increased oxygen pressure, the amount of ROS increases, and it may oxidize other molecules that are also important for biological processes as well as compromising the integrity of biological structures. Especially important is the interaction of ROSs with nitric oxide or NO, which is another important signaling molecule. ROSs occur everywhere in the body, particularly where there is high blood supply and high oxygen metabolism. Nitric oxide is also present in all tissues of the body but may play different roles depending on the tissue. The interaction between ROS and NO exhibits the most dramatic effect in the central nervous system and lungs, although practically every organ and tissue may be affected. Recent studies have revealed that chronic pulmonary oxygen toxicity at low oxygen pressure is mainly caused by ROSs, whereas newly described acute pulmonary oxygen toxicity is caused mainly by NO-mediated massive sympathetic outflow from the brain. Effects of oxygen on the autonomic nervous system. Nitric oxide has an important role in oxygen toxicity through its modulating effects on the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system consists of two opposing sides, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, which regulate the function of every organ. In general, the sympathetic nervous system excites the body, preparing it for action, while the parasympathetic nervous system calms it down to promote recovery and restoration. In the central nervous system, NO decreases the activity of the sympathetic nervous system, whereas in the periphery, it causes widening of blood vessels or vasodilation. When the concentration of oxygen is increased at normal or slightly elevated ambient pressure, the ROSs in the periphery bind nitric oxide and therefore cause arteries to remain narrow, which may lead to a transient increase in blood pressure. At this point, baroreceptors, which are specialized neural nodes that monitor blood pressure, become activated and send signals to the brain to decrease the sympathetic activity and thereby reduce blood pressure. This is one of the secondary benefits sometimes seen in hypertensive patients receiving hyperbaric oxygen therapy for other indications. However, 
If oxygen pressures exceed three atmospheres absolute, all the NO is occupied by ROSs and none remains available to control the sympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic activity becomes suddenly extreme and the levels of adrenaline and noradrenaline in the circulation increase dramatically, a so-called adrenergic storm. This potentiates the narrowing of arteries in the periphery and increases blood pressure and heart rate. The arteries in the heart may actually narrow to the point that the heart muscle itself does not receive enough blood flow. The pumping effectiveness of the left heart can fail and the blood pressure in the pulmonary circulation increases so that the pulmonary blood vessels are damaged and gas exchange becomes compromised. This acute lung damage precedes the onset of seizures. Artificial stimulation of the parasympathetic system via the vagal nerve may actually counteract these effects. In fact, a new treatment method has been developed for patients with epilepsy that could not be controlled with medication. These patients now receive an implant that provides continuous electrical stimulation to the vagal nerve and prevents the occurrence of seizures. Similar effects were demonstrated using a medication called propanolol, which is an adrenergic blocker, which also reduces sympathetic activity. Unfortunately, propanolol is not a selective beta blocker and can have serious side effects. The protective effect in humans has not been confirmed and do not use it unless directed by a physician. The autonomic nervous system is key to understanding oxygen toxicity. The role of the autonomic nervous system in oxygen toxicity in humans has not yet been fully explored. The autonomic nervous system changes with age and various chronic diseases, all of which may affect divers. We have just scratched the surface in answering the questions. Dan was instrumental in studying two common drugs and the effects they may have on the autonomic nervous system and increase the risk of oxygen toxicity. Phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors used to treat erectile dysfunction such as Viagra and Cialis being some of the most familiar as well as pseudoephedrine were tested in this regard. Dan was contacted by a diver who experienced symptoms of oxygen toxicity after using nitrox at a partial pressure of 1.3. He'd done so on previous dives without problems. His exposure to oxygen was within the limits that were considered safe, but this time he had used Cialis, one of the PDE5 inhibitors, the night before his dive. The drug scores widening of arteries responsible for erection, but theoretically may cross into the circulation of the brain and increase sympathetic activities there. It was not known whether this could increase divers' risks of oxygen toxicity. Dr. Ivan Demchenko and his team at Duke University conducted animal studies and confirmed that rats treated with PDE5s seized sooner than untreated animals. As such, the lesson for divers is not to use PDE5 inhibitors the night before diving. The lesson for divers is that the use of particularly long-acting PDE5 inhibitors the night before diving may not be safe. Attention should be given to the duration of the chosen medication as well as the partial pressures of oxygen likely to be encountered on planned dives. The diver should discuss dive plans with a DAN medic or doctor trained in diving medicine. In the case of pseudoephedrine or Sudafed, things evolve differently. Several divers who experienced symptoms of O2 toxicity called DAN and blamed pseudoephedrine an active ingredient in decongestant medications. Dan contracted an animal study with the University of South Florida. The study indicated that normal doses of pseudoephedrine should not increase the risk of seizures in the majority of divers. But there was individual variability in susceptibility to oxygen toxicity. Sufficient variability to explain why divers sometimes do get toxic symptoms within safe exposures. It was also demonstrated that very large doses, which may be achieved if a diver uses multiple over-the-counter drugs containing pseudoephedrine, 
may increase susceptibility to oxygen toxicity. Protection. Is there a way to protect from oxygen toxicity? So far, there are no drugs that would practically increase tolerance to oxygen, but these may be developed in the future. There were hopes that some antioxidants, such as vitamin E and C, could protect against oxygen toxicity. While this may be true in animals who lack these vitamins, in normally fed animals, no beneficial effects were demonstrated. On the other hand, there are many drugs that increase or potentially could increase oxygen toxicity, such as rezepine, quinetidine, thyroxin, disulfiram, and several others. Divers taking medications for chronic conditions should consult their physician before getting involved in nitrox or mixed gas diving. The best protection is to keep the inspired oxygen pressure below 1.2 while physically active and below or at 1.6 during decompression. In addition, use low oxygen brakes, control carbon dioxide and do not overexert yourself. Stay warm and be fit and healthy. Divers further wishing to reduce the risk of drowning due to seizures might consider using full face masks and should never dive alone.